So it's a pleasure to get to introduce Vikram Patel and Sheikh Arthur Hussain today. As is well known here, in 2007, the Lancet published its own first series on global mental health, calling for the scaling up of global mental health services on the principles of the right to evidence-based <coughs> care and the right to dignity. Such advocacy influenced the funding and ultimately the implementation of novel approaches to global mental health care, and would ultimately intersect with the articulation of the UN's Sustainable Development Goals and the adoption of the WHO's Comprehensive Mental Health Action Plan. Despite such advocacy and action, again, as is well known here, global mental health would remain both absolutely and comparatively neglected, leading to the present Lancet Commission on Global Mental Health and Sustainable Development, which continues to frame mental health as a fundamental human right. In anticipation of the launch of the Commission's report, we're honored to have two of its key authors, along with, I should note, Dr. Kleinman from our department, uh, who's also one of the authors, to present on its key findings. Vikram Patel is, is the Pershing Square Professor of Global Health in our department, adjunct professor and joint director of the Center for Chronic Conditions and Injuries at the Public Health Foundation of India, and honorary professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and co-founder of the Center for Global Mental Health in 2008. He's also the co-founder of Sangha, and we had the opportunity to hear about Sangha's vision and work in closing the mental health treatment gap for young children in India, and Gauri Devon's excellent talk here almost exactly a year ago. You come as an impressive co-presenter here today, Shekhar Sena, who both received his medical degree, conducted his residency at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, and was the director of the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse at the WHO, and a joint leader of the Mental Health Innovation Network. His current responsibilities include the implementation of the WHO Comprehensive Mental Health Action Plan, and like Dr. Patel, he's been a key figure in the multiple Lancet series on global mental health from the beginning. This year, we're fortunate to also host him as a visiting professor at the Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health. So together, Dr. Patel and Dr. Saxena will give us a real sneak preview of the key messages of the forthcoming Lancet Commission Report on Global Mental Health and Sustainable Development. So thank you so much for being here today. Uh, thank you, Scott, and uh, thank you all for coming along. Um, to be honest, uh, this is definitely a sneak preview uh, because actually the commission will be launched. Uh, I'll just wait for that's all. So uh, the commission will be launched on, uh, on next Wednesday, and we'll tell you a little bit more about the launch. So this is actually like the home crowd, uh, and we're hoping that we'll get some interesting discussion going. Uh, I think uh, this is probably a more friendly audience than some of the ones that we will face. Uh, so, um, and this is also some, a work, work that has taken three years to produce. Uh, some of it, it also, with all these commissions, not a lot of it is new, but I hope that some of it will also present a fresh way of thinking about mental health. Uh, that might lie at the heart of some of the recommendations that uh, you would hear about. So the way we're going to do this is that uh, I'm going to start by giving you a, 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 a preamble about why we needed a commission and what the guiding principles are. That's what excites me greatly are the three fundamental principles in which uh, action has been, uh, around which action has been uh, framed. In fact, we consider this a reframing of mental health uh, uh, going forward. And then Shekhar will take us through the recommendations uh, of the commission and then we want to end by giving you a snapshot of some of the public engagement work that we have been working on for the last three to four months, uh, ending off with uh, an animated video that will be launched uh, next week, <coughs> amongst many other products that we have, including six animated videos prepared by slam poets, young slam poets from around the world, etc. So this is, this is not just a scientific report, but it's actually part of a much broader global campaign um, to really re assert the importance of mental health as not just central uh, to our future uh, as individuals, but I would argue even to our very humanity as a society. So I'm going to start by really uh, uh, you know, posing the question why we need uh, a, a commission. Uh, and I can see some people on, on the corner there. You can always come here. There's an empty seat here as well. And, uh, and you can just come up here. And, and I'm sure we can. Uh, there's also some seats here on the ledges. So why we need a commission. Um, then, as I said, the three different principles that underlie the reframing of mental health. For some of you, they will be novel. For others, it will be a repackaging of what I think many of us have already had strong views about. And the final uh, piece will be the response that we need to make collectively, uh, and Shekhar will be talking more about that. So I want to start with a part of history of global mental health. I think it's important to remember that we are standing on the shoulders of to use a metaphor, giants, work that has happened over the last 20 years, 
But as a part of history, I want to start with recognizing, first of all, that this department actually is the home uh, in many ways of uh, much of the original thinking around this field through this landmark book that uh, involved many departmental, well, in fact, three former chairs of the department, uh, Leon Eisenberg, Byron Good, and Arthur Kleinman, for those of you at the back who can't read, uh, the, 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 can't see the title of the book. World Mental Health, for me, certainly was a very defining book. In 1995, I was working in Zimbabwe, uh, and I remember when the book came out, it was an incredible new way of thinking about mental health beyond mental illness. <laughs> Shekhar led the World Health Report in 2001, uh, and I think this was the first time in the history of the WHO that the annual World Health Report was dedicated uh, to the subject of mental health. Um, Shekhar and I then jointly led uh, the Lancet series, the first one that really established the word global mental health and really positioned what we now describe as global mental health as a discipline of global health. Um, and I continue to see this as a discipline of global health rather than a discipline of one of the clinical mental health pro, uh, 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 areas. Although, of course, those are very central, but we are uh, essentially uh, within the umbrella of global health. In 2011, the NIMH-led uh, Grand Challenges in Global Mental Health was published in Nature, uh, and that was another, I think, a formative event because this really opened the door to a vast body of uh, implementation science that has really led uh, to the Lancet Commission's recommendations in many ways. And then in the same year, I think it was a year after, I can't remember, 2013. Oh, sorry, 2013, again, Shaker led at the World Health Organization uh, the Comprehensive Mental Health Action Plan, which is an agreement by the, in all the nations of the world, I think, uh, at the World Health Assembly uh, to really, for countries to commit themselves to very specific actions. And as we progress down this, uh, this, this timeline, we've seen more and more nuancing and refinement of the global mental health agenda, and that is really where uh, the Commission uh, uh, positions itself uh, really 10 years after the original Lancet series. This is probably the foundational event, 2015. The Sustainable Development Goals, all of you know what those are. Uh, many of us are, are trying to connect the health areas that we are passionate about with the SDGs. Of course, health is just one of the many goals in the SDGs, goal number three. But within that, for the first time, this, this transfer, transformational vision of development, transformational because the MDGs were very narrow, there were eight goals. Um, in the health area, they focused only on a few conditions that were particularly important for developing countries. The SDGs are truly global. They affect all countries. And the health goal, for example, reflects that by including non-communicable diseases and very importantly, mental health in three of the different health targets. But of course, mental health is also <coughs> intimately associated with many of the other SDGs and the Commission report speaks a lot to that and Shaker will as well in the recommendations uh, a little later. So I don't want to read this, but this is just to show you these are the, some of these uh, the copy and paste are actually from the Lancet report, uh, just to illustrate uh, some of the some of the actual content of the, of the commission. <coughs> but here you can see the targets, targets 3.4, 3.5, and 3.8 are the ones that specifically refer to mental health. Target 3.4 interestingly talks about prevention and treatment uh, uh, for NCDs, but in the mental health area, it talks about promotion of mental health and well-being, and I'll circle back to that later. Target 3.5 is particularly about substance use conditions, alcohol, uh, and other harmful substances, and target 3.8 is referring to universal health coverage. Okay, so this is the part of history, what's the challenge? Well, let's first examine the challenge in a number of different ways. The first challenge is that mental health problems as a burden of disease uh, is increasing in all countries of the world, no matter how rich or poor they are. Uh, they are. And here you can see between 1991 and 2016, the relative burden according to, in countries uh, categorized according to how uh, developed they are. The, the, red bar, uh, the red line being the uh, most developed countries <coughs> in the world and the blue line being the least developed countries in the world. You can see an incline in all of these countries. Uh, and if I have to summarize the overall change, it's about 50% increase in the past 25 years. Why is that the case? That is the case because of the very unique epidemiology of mental health problems that they basically have their onset in, young, in youth, basically in late adolescence and young adulthood. And so why is that an important driver uh, of the increasing burden? That's because 
much of the world is actually aging in two different sections. The first aging process is happening from childhood into youth, and you see this dramatically in sub-Saharan Africa and in South Asia. Um, and the other kind of aging, which of course is related to new de degeneration, is happening in the rest of the world, which is aging into the older adult age group when you start seeing the onset of dementia. So it is these two powerful demographic transitions that are actually fueling a lot of the changing proportionate burden of mental and substance use disorders globally. And we are seeing mental health problems emerge now in the news all the time as very lethal conditions, something that we haven't always acknowledged. Here is one example. The Lancet Public Health published this last month. Um, it's not just a leading cause of death. Uh, suicide is not just a leading cause of death in young married women, but actually it's a leading cause of death in young people in India today. Um, between the ages of 18 and 40, it is more likely that a young person will die <coughs> because of suicide than any other single cause of death. This was the truth in China as well, and it would be fair to say, hello, Byron, uh, it would be fair to say that uh, suicide is actually one of the leading causes of death in young people globally. Um, and that is something that we haven't always taken account of. The second cause of death, which I think is very close to our hearts here in, in, in the US, is the fact that opiates, uh, or overdose is now the leading cause of death in young Americans. Um, alcohol abuse is the leading cause of death in young Russians, and East Europeans, etc. So oftentimes we think of mental health problems as being something that is intangible, something that doesn't kill in the kind of way that more tangible health concerns uh, are, are associated with. But actually, when it comes to youth, mental health problems kill more young people than any other cause of death. And this is true of all countries of the world, albeit for different reasons. And indeed, you can see that one of the reasons why we don't often count uh, the mortality associated with mental health problems is because the way the global burden of disease counts the causes of death, it, counts, it, it attributes the death to the most proximal cause. So, for example, if I was a, a, a heavy drinker and I died of cirrhosis of the liver, the cause of death would be cirrhosis of the liver, not the fact that it would not have happened if I wasn't actually drinking heavily. Uh, similarly, suicide, quite bizarrely, is not counted as a cause of death for mental health problems. Uh, you die because of suicide. So when we asked the GBD group that looked at mortality to recompute the causes of the numbers of deaths that were uh, because of risk factors <coughs> associated with poor mental health, that is to say the excess mortality, that occurred in people with mental health problems, and of course that includes substance use problems, the actual numbers that they arrived at was nearly 14 million deaths each year. So I, I keep reiterating this because much of the conversations in global health have focused on mortality, which I think we all agree is extremely important. If you can avoid a death, this is a very important goal. But these are all, to a large extent, avoidable deaths that occur in the prime of your life. That is to say between the ages of 18 and 50. The other important point, that, uh, challenge that, that, that we should draw attention to is that there is a dramatic increase in the social, some of the social determinants. Of course, there's also been an improvement. We should have a balanced view on this. The fact that huge sections of the population have moved from being absolutely poor to being uh, outside uh, absolute poverty is something we should celebrate. I almost know, there's almost no doubt that that is a very beneficial uh, a, a social determinant uh, on one's mental health. But there's also all these other kinds um, of disadvantages and social determinants, some of which show no sign of reducing and others which are actually increasing. I should add one thing that we haven't shown on this slide, uh, which we should because there's some dramatic <coughs> images of that, is inequality. Um, there's some terrific <coughs> images that have just come from Mumbai, but actually this will also be said of Boston, um, is how, in fact, there are straight lines that separate people who live uh, extremely well-off lives with those who live in very deprived uh, circumstances and inequality as really fracturing the social fabric of society is another important driver of poor mental health. And then we've got the economic burden. Colleagues like Dan Chisholm, as well as David Bloom at the School of Public Health, have computed the impact of mental health problems, in this case particularly mood and anxiety problems, the leading, uh, the most common causes of uh, uh, mental ill health on both uh, lost work and lost uh, economic uh, productivity. Now, with all this evidence on burden and impact, how are countries doing when it comes to investing in mental health? Well, not very well. 
Here you can see the years lived with disability, which is a global burden of disease metric. Uh, for low, low middle income, upper middle income, and high income countries, you can see, for example, it ranges from about 25% to just about a third of the overall burden of years lived with disability can be attributed to mental and substance use disorders. So let's now look at how these countries are actually investing in mental health by looking at the fraction of the overall healthcare budget that invests in mental health. And I must thank Chudling, who actually did these earlier analyses. Um, uh, and you can see that it doesn't really matter in which country you're in, uh, all countries systematically underspend on mental health when you consider the, the, the overall burden of disease due to mental health problems. Um, in fact, as, as I'm sure Shekhar will talk to as, uh, uh, earlier, you know, the truth is when we talk of global health in many, many, um, uh, in many contexts, really it's just simply a euphemism for what we used to call international health. It's still very much focused on people out there um, in developing countries. But actually what you can see here is there was one subject of, of, of health that unites the world in terms of injustice. It is mental health. So I really do think that mental health is a true global health subject because all countries, and this I'm borrowing from Shekhar's line, uh, are, are, are developing when it comes to mental health, and, and this one is no exception. Now, when we look at development assistance, this is the sort of, uh, uh, of money that rich countries give to poor countries uh, in order to support their health system. Um, you can see here the dollars uh, in million per DALI, that is the burden of disease for HIV, uh, malaria, TB, and maternal health conditions. Of course, these are very large bars because these were the MDG uh, targets. And it's good to know that the world did respond to the MDG targets. Uh, and hopefully, we will now see a similar response to the SDG targets. Um, and you can see that in contrast, when it comes to non-communicable diseases and mental and substance use disorders, there's no mouse click that's going to show you a bar because actually that is, in fact, the real figure. It doesn't show up when you scale the chart uh, against these infectious diseases. So we spend very little on our own people, and we spend very little on those who live in the poorest countries of the world. So what is the consequence of this systematic underinvestment in mental health? Here I'm going to show you a chart that, this, uh, these are all from the Commission, uh, I'm going to show you a chart that reports on what is the proportion of people in different countries of the world organized according to whether they are developing or low middle income countries or high income countries who receive minimally effective care? This is important. It's not just receiving a, a single session of psychotherapy or one prescription uh, of an antidepressant uh, uh, medication, but actually receiving it in the way that trials actually demonstrate that you need to receive it in order to uh, uh, realize its full benefits. So what proportion of anxiety, depression, and substance use uh, affected patients receive minimally affected uh, treatments. Well, let's look at the poorest countries in the world. More than 95% of people have not. This must be one of the largest unmet needs for care for any health condition globally. Now, rich countries, of course, enjoy much more by way of resources. And let's see how well they perform. Well, it turns out they perform much better. This is not surprising. But consider this, that even in the richest countries in the world, more than 80% of people with mood and anxiety problems, uh, and nearly 90% with substance use problems do not receive minimally effective treatment. This is in spite of spending maybe 1,000 times more than the poorest countries of the world. This is an important point uh, to keep in mind, because it isn't the case that simply throwing more money at the problem is going to solve it. Uh, if that was the case, we should see much better results here. There's also something wrong with some of the paradigms. Uh, that have been used for mental health care, uh, which we need to address. And then, of course, you have, as Arthur has very eloquently written about, uh, another horrific consequence of the systematic undervaluing of mental health is yeah, these sorts of images. These are mainly taken from mental hospitals in the Global South. But I wanted to include this image, which is from a U.S. prison, um, because, you know, the truth is uh, that although these sorts of horrific uh, uh, human rights abuses no longer occur in a hospital setting in, 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 in countries like the U.S., they now have simply shifted uh, from the hospital to either the street or the prison. So we need to reframe simply because in spite of this mountain of evidence, the world simply hasn't responded in the way that it should. Um, and I've already mentioned the next point. And I think very importantly, we need to go beyond a narrow biomedical framing uh, of, of mental illness. Uh, we need to go beyond the treatment gap, which is a word that, in fact, we use a lot in the first Lancet series. And we need to recognize that we actually need to redefine treatment as care, which goes beyond just biomedical approaches, but a much broader understanding of the needs of people with mental health problems. And quality 
which of course has been written about a lot in recent times by colleagues at the School of Public Health. And of course, also recognize, and I'm derived that Myron is here, for example, that we have an enormous evidence on prevention. Uh, we have undersold that evidence, mainly because prevention doesn't happen in the health sector when it comes to mental health. But we will need to recognize that we do have ideas about prevention, and we haven't communicated those effectively enough. And so we need to go beyond just reducing the treatment gap to being more ambitious and aspirational and saying we can, with the knowledge we have, do something to actually reduce the burden. In the same kind of way that, you know, let's say an oncologist, uh, a cancer expert, wouldn't be just satisfied saying I want to, you know, improve access to, you know, cancer treatment. No, I would only be satisfied if the incidence of cancer reduced. And we should be far more aspirational in the mental health field uh, by, by saying, yes, we do have the knowledge, but we aren't doing much with it. So I'm going to now finish with the three guiding principles and then hand over uh, to Shekhar. There are three guiding principles that have uh, been at the heart of how we think we should reframe mental health. And I'd be, I'm sure Shekhar and I would be very keen, especially to hear from you uh, about uh, these three principles. The first principle is to reject and move away from a narrow binary biomedicalization of mental health. Into, let's be honest, you know, in most places when you use the word mental health, most people really think you're, thinking, you're talking about mental health. And this is for good reason. It's because that's how the word mental health has often been utilized. We talk about mental health, but actually we could immediately flip over into talking about the treatments for mental illness. But we need to recognize that there is no way to carve nature as a joint when it comes to mental health. We're talking about a dimension that extends from wellness all the way through to psychosocial disability, and that each of us at any given point of our lives is somewhere on this spectrum or dimension. And the goal for each individual, each human being, is to move to the healthier end of the spectrum by using interventions that enable us to do so, but as it were, appropriate for where we are on that spectrum. And so you could use the words promotion, staying well when you are well, prevention, for when you have the early signals or symptoms of distress, to remission to when you are actually having a clinically significant disorder and recognizing that there are some individuals for whom cure or remission is not the goal, but actually social inclusion is the goal. People who actually have uh, enduring disabling consequences uh, of mental ill health. And in doing so, you are able to unify all these different narratives into one dimensional perspective. Now, we also, in the report, talk about how that would practically be delivered using a stage model of mental health, but I won't go into that right now. The second is to move away from this very, uh, I, I consider, very naive distinction between nature and nurture and recognize that we know the science tells us very clearly it's, it's both. And how is it both? Well, in this chart, I'm going to show you, some, it's, it's, again, a very potted account of a very complex subject, but try and, to try and summarize what we call a convergent understanding of mental health and therefore also mental illness. So our genes clearly define, as it were, the canvas in which our personal stories will be painted over the course of our lives. But then there are very important neurodevelopmental processes, which we now know far better than we did even 10 or 15 years ago, that help us explain a few very important aspects about mechanism. The first important, and I, again, apologies for those who are neuroscientists, this is a very simplistic demonstration for, because this is also to communicate to broad audiences, including generalists. The first important piece is plasticity. We now have uh, amazing rich evidence about how responsive the brain is to the environment, both structurally and functionally. And this is most in the first two decades of life, but particularly in the first 10 years of life. The second is we also now know that during the phase of adolescence, there are two uh, uh, complementary processes in brain development that are happening. One is there's a reorientation of connections in, in, in the brain, something that is called pruning. Um, which is basically literally like pruning a tree. Many, many connections are actually pruned down. Uh, and at the same time, different parts of the brain are maturing in a different way. And I won't go into detail. Suffice to say that we now know that impulsivity, risk-taking, and thrill-seeking are part of being an adolescent. They're not pathologies. This is actually a normative evolutionary aspect of, of human development. And the third uh, 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 process is, of course, cell death. Actually, cell death occurs right from the beginning, and pruning is a good example of some uh, of cell death. But in the way that we understand senescence of the brain, the, uh, that, that is to say, reduced volume uh, uh, and density of brain, uh, uh, of brain connections, this clearly accelerates as we go 
later into life. So you can see these three developmental processes, uh, and we know that the environment is critical because the brain is constantly in this developmental game actually interacting with the environment. It is shaping our environment and being shaped by our environment. So this is rich science, comes from both animal studies as well as human studies. Now, if I had to superimpose on this when mental health problems occur, it's pretty remarkable that they actually occur exactly at these developmentally sensitive phases. So it isn't an accident that most mental health problems begin in youth, nor is it an accident that most neurodegeneration begins in older age. And so this is what we call the convergent view, the idea that neurodevelopment actually allows us to merge findings from social determinants, from uh, uh, neuroscience, etc., to have an understanding of the reasons why mental health problems emerge when they do. And the final guiding principle, uh, of course, very heavily influenced by the disability movement, is the rights-based approach. And here we talk about three key rights, the right to be protected, and this is extremely important for those who are facing risk factors like refugees, people escaping conflict. They have the right for their mental health to not be harmed as a consequence of their, we may not be able to stop the war that displaced those uh, populations, but they do have the right to make sure that the harmful effects uh, as a consequence can be mitigated. And then the, the next two rights are really largely for people who already have mental health problems, the right to receive care, and for people with psychosocial disability at the extreme end of that uh, dimension, the right to dignity, uh, uh, the right to dignity, and I would add to that the right to freedom uh, in many countries of the world. So how, I'm not going to say much about that, I just wanted to emphasize that we actually in the report have a huge amount of information about the how. Uh, we start with actually, you know, uh, acknowledging that the mental health care field has done some of the most innovative things that the rest of medicine can learn from. Uh, recognizing, for example, that the institutionalization, the move from hospitals to the community, was actually championed by mental health uh, colleagues way before our time, uh, and that is something that is unique in medicine. Uh, the fact that we involve families uh, and patients in planning services is also unique. Very few branches of medicine have actually done that, actual co-production uh, with, uh, with people with a lived experience. Seeing social interventions as an integral part of mental health care is another really unique innovation of, 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 of the fields of clinical mental health practice. And of course, person-centered care, focusing on comorbidities, coexisting me medical, uh, that is, physical conditions and mental health conditions. So I think we need to start with a nod that mental health care professionals have actually often been incredibly innovative. The tragedy, of course, is that other aspects of our practice has really held back the opportunity to reach these innovations to large sections of the population. And those innovations that we summarize that come from the last 10 or 15 years of new science, uh, psychosocial interventions by non-specialist workers is one that excites me personally. The fact that we now have huge evidence on how empirically supported psychological interventions can be delivered by a range of different providers, widely available in every country. Digital tools, I won't say much about that, except that I know all of us are very excited by the prospects, but of course there's still a lot of work to be done to ensure these are used safely. The balanced care model, that is to recognize using the dimensional spectrum so that not everybody needs to see a specialist, but there will be some people who do. And therefore, having coordinated balanced care models that achieve the goals of the full dimension of mental health is, uh, is something that we should be aspiring to in a population-based model. And finally, engaging people with a lived experience and communities to increase demand and accountability. The platform of care is, of course, comes from the disease control priorities uh, volume, uh, which really looks at, essentially, the delivery of this kind of approach uh, across these different platforms in a coordinated model. Uh, and this is my last slide, and I'll give it over to Shekhar now. And you, I'm not intending you to read this, but in the report you can see we spent a lot of time thinking of which interventions we believe have sufficient evidence uh, to be scaled up uh, in low resource, medium resource, and high resource settings. Remember, see, we, we're no longer using the word country. Uh, and this is actually another very important shift in our thinking, is that we think these settings occur in all countries. Uh, and so it isn't whether a country on a national level is rich or poor, but it's really how well every community in that country is being resourced. Uh, and so I'm sure all of you who work here will know that there are settings just like this uh, in the U.S. as well. Um, and so we're looking at establishing certain standards of care, and very importantly, not just clinical care, but also interventions for promotion and prevention. 
Shekhar. Thank you very much, Scott. Thank you, Vikram, for explaining. I'm privileged and pleased to be here and presenting some of the findings that uh, the Lancet Commission presents. Uh, this is a work by 28 people. I'll show you their names later on and their faces over three years' time. So it's obviously uh, taken a lot of effort to do that. But what does it mean, finally? What's the audience for Lancet Commission? It's a diverse group of people that we're targeting, but in our mind, the first audience is policymakers. If they listen to the, uh, to the conversation, if they get some of the basic messages about reframing mental health, they see it in the right way, and if they are willing to do something more about it, that's what is going to be an indicator for success for all the efforts that have been made. And with that in mind, the primary launch, the first launch, we have several launches. The primary launch is in front of ministers in UK a week from now, where we believe about 40 ministers are going to join from high, medium, and low-income countries. And hopefully they will go back convinced that they need to do something more about mental health. The Lancet Commission makes uh, seven recommendations. The first one, reframing mental health within the SDG framework, which can be explained extremely well, so I won't go into detail of this at all. We would like to see mental health as an integral part of health, but also as an integral part of development itself. And that's the reframing that we really need to emphasize so that it doesn't remain alone the responsibility of Minister of Health. In fact, Minister of Health should actually be arguing about why mental health should be given more importance to his or her colleagues in the finance ministry, in the education ministry, in many other ministries. <coughs> and that's the, that's the kind of message that we want them to get. Uh, having just referred to the first recommendation, I would come straight back to the seventh recommendation, actually, which is to strengthen monitoring and accountability. If investments have to be made, we need to monitor the situation and we need to have accountability as to how these investments are being used. Right now, WHO, as an organization, I worked in WHO for 20 years' time. I'm no more working actually now there. I'm based in Harvard now. Has uh, led the accountability and monitoring mechanism, but we believe and we are recommending from the Lancet Commission that it has to be much more independent and it has to be much more comprehensive. So those are issues that the Lancet Commission very clearly uh, goes for. Obviously, accountability will be more important when there are more investments. Right now, as Vikram showed, the investments are actually very poor. So we're hoping for both better investments and better accountability. For the rest of the five recommendations, I will have a slide each to talk about that. The first very clear and practical recommendation is that mental health is and should be an essential component of universal health coverage. You're all aware that universal health coverage is one of the goals within the SDG under the health. We're also aware that WHO has kept universal health coverage as one of the top three priorities for the whole organization. And a very large number of countries have accepted the principle of universal health coverage as a guiding principle for their health policy. And we just want to make sure that when they plan their universal health care policy, they do not anymore forget mental health. That's, that's the objective of this. This is also one of the calls from the 2007 uh, Lancet uh, series of articles. We believe, as Vikram has just now explained, that delivery of care should be possible with task sharing all along the health system, and use of technology can facilitate and enhance care. Uh, this particular recommendation, which I'm presenting in one slide, is actually quite a long passage in the commission, so I would uh, very much request you uh, and suggest to you that uh, on 10th when it comes out, you spend a little time reading that, which is very clear uh, practical guidelines as to how countries can actually do something about it. The second recommendation, which is quite important, especially from the dimensional aspects, is protecting mental health with actions on social, de social determinants, and that's where it's the whole of the government all sectors which need to be involved, because majority of these are outside the health sector. So we do know that alleviating poverty actually has a beneficial effect on population mental health. We know that promoting nutrition, specifically 
in the younger age groups but also in the older age group have an impact on decreasing the morbidity and the disability associated with uh, mental disorders and actually prevent mental disorders. We do know that extreme poverty and undernourishment during the critical periods of childhood can have an enormous effect on not only growth and development, but even the development of clear mental disorders in older life. We know that uh, education is a protective mechanism uh, against uh, going something going wrong with our mental health. So education for all is extremely important. Enhancing equity, advocating for gender equality, and opposing and taking care of uh, violence are very clear actions which can enhance mental health all over the life. Strengthening public engagement, we do believe that uh, mental health is too important to be left in the hands of a specialist. So we do believe that community need to be very intimately involved in planning for their mental health care uh, as well as promoting mental health care. And there are many evidence-based interventions to, to reduce stigma and discrimination which have been all pervading and in all societies. Again, this is not an issue for low and middle income countries. It's an issue, issue for all communities. The stigma and discrimination are common. Uh, we have not spent too much time on this here, but the Lancet Commission actually does talk about the spe uh, specific strategies to reduce stigma discrimination, which not only are bad in themselves and affect human rights, but are also very clearly a, a barrier in seeking care. People who feel stigmatized <coughs> do not want to actually go and identify themselves as having the need for that. And many people actually die because of suicide, because they did not have the courage to go and seek help. So that's something which is extremely important, engaging civil society in a meaningful manner, and especially involving young people and people with lived experience in all activities, including policy making, service planning, and research. It's quite important for a place like Harvard. Are we involving some of the people with lived experience <coughs> in the research that we believe is going to benefit them? And that's something which is becoming increasingly important now for us to be uh, taking care of. And uh, people with lived experience are actually helping us a lot in the launch of the Lancet uh, Commission. And we believe they will take this action forward in, in a much better way than many professions can. So we, we are really placing a lot of importance on that. Make more and better investments <coughs> in mental health. Vikram has showed you the slides, uh, which come partly from WHO, to say how poor the national financing has been. We do believe that there is need for much more financing. At least 5% of health budget in low and middle income countries, and at least 10% of health budget in high income countries. Majority of countries are far from this level. So even these look like very ambitious targets. But again, <coughs> let me go back to what I said earlier. It's not only the health budget. We are actually hoping that there will be budget outside the health sector which will go into promoting mental health. So that's another story. But also using resources more efficiently and effectively. There is very clear evidence that with the very small budget which countries allocate, a quite a large percentage of that goes into mental hospitals, which is a very inefficient way of using the precious resources that we have. So a balanced care and good utilization and effective and efficient utilization of resources is equally important because, as Vikram said, throwing more money does not mean that we receive more mental health back. And also spending more developmental assistance to mental health, bilaterally as well as multilaterally. So organizations like USAID, DFID, and all other development organizations are spending much less than even 1% of their budget on that, and we believe there is need to increase. And also bigger foundations, which have invested a lot of money in, in health, are still not going into mental health area, and we believe there is need for that. In fact, there is a table in the Lancet Commission which talks about the priorities of the foundations, as we see them now, the biggest foundations, and how some of their current agenda could actually be inclusive of mental health without them changing and getting the board approval for a new window to be created. Reinvigorate research based on the grant challenges uh, model to support board discovery and delivery science. We believe both are important. We need more discovery. We need to find out more about why mental health uh, issues come up. 
uh, and also how best to take care of them. But there is a very clear gap between discovery and implementation. And we believe we have the knowledge that we are not utilizing fully. So there is emphasis on delivery science, which again, a place like Harvard can contribute a lot. Understanding early stages of development, developing new prevention interventions, detection of uh, uh, problems early, transdiagnostic interventions, because we know that many interventions are actually effective against many diagnoses, and we haven't had much research on that, including scaling up of care by less trained providers, user technology, and enhancing demand for services, which again touches back on the stigma and discrimination side. We believe that there is need for reframing mental health as a global public good, for including it as an essential component of universal human quality, to be part of health, important for all people in all countries, especially relevant for youth, and also a crucial contributor to human capital. In fact, we know that World Bank is rediscovering the concept of human capital, and it is actually going towards, and we hope they do go all the way, to say, are there other indices besides the GDP which indicate the potential of a country and a society to make rapid progress in the future? And we believe that inclusion of mental health and developmental issues within the index will be extremely useful. So the Lancet Commission, in short, recommends that from no health without mental health, which we talked about in 2007, we go towards no sustainable development without mental health. Thank you very much. I just wanted to acknowledge uh, the many people who have uh, you know, taken, uh, these are all the authors, uh, and I'm sure you recognize Arthur as well. Uh, and. Um, these are the, the organizations that supported us uh, from the beginning. Uh, and, uh, and I think uh, just to say a few words about the public engagement, and then we'll open it up for questions. So this is the, the announcement for the summit uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, the Wednesday is when the commission will be officially launched and when all the uh, products that you will soon uh, you see in a moment about will, will be available online on a, a specific website. Um, these are the partners that we worked with over the last six months. For us, it's not good enough now to publish in a journal no one reads, uh, but actually to start working with communities that are, in fact, actively engaging with, uh, uh, with, with, with society. And, you know, all of this, you, the, Oxford is university. They have the most amazing uh, young people's forum uh, in, in, in that university that has, for example, brought together six slam poets, all young poets from around the world, uh, to write uh, fresh poetry around the commission recommendations. Uh, and I've seen two or three of those, and they're incredible. They also have artists who are doing this. So they're 60 to 90 second uh, videos where the, the slam poet speaks in his or her own voice, their poem. And uh, I hope when you see them on ne next week that you will, uh, you will you'll enjoy it. You'll find them quite compelling. Um, I also wanted to say a few words about our own initiative here. Um, you know, as you know, many of you know, we launched an initiative in April this year called Global Mental Health at Harvard, mm -hmm. and we're getting ready for the launch uh, to really uh, begin to announce a few partnerships. For example, we're in conversation with a few partners to start an accountability mechanism uh, uh, that can be centered here at, uh, in, in Harvard. We are also looking at some other partners around uh, health communication, uh, particularly communicating with development agencies uh, and a third partnership uh, with digital companies uh, on how to prepare uh, a, a, a platform for building capacity for psychological therapy. So really taking some of our recommendations and beginning to explore funding opportunities with, through strategic partnerships um, uh, around some of, these, uh, 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 some of these recommendations. So I'm now going to show you, this is, this is a, it's still being finalized. Uh, this is a, an example uh, of one of the products that a company called Global Health Strategies uh, has produced based on the commission. This is their interpretation. Uh, and it's like one of these little videos which will be pretty. This is not a slam for it, by the way. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an overview. It's a couple of minutes, and I'll just show it to you uh, to give you a sense of the sorts of products that we will release. Um, so why does the world need a commission on global no. mental health and sustainable development? Because so the volume up. mental right. ill health is on the rise worldwide, causing early death and fueling cycles of poverty. Most people with mental health problems do not receive care, which prolongs suffering. 
and leads to colossal societal and economic losses. Even worse, they are often subjected to human rights abuses and discrimination. To respond to these challenges and help achieve the Sustainable Development Goal, the Commission outlines a comprehensive blueprint for action. This Commission has three unique guiding principles. One, our approach to mental health covers the full spectrum of mental health, from day-to-day -day wellness to long-term disabling conditions. We know how to promote mental health prevent mental disorders, and enable recovery. It's time to use this knowledge to benefit entire populations. Two, mental health is the product of psychosocial, <laughs> environmental, biological, okay. and genetic okay. factors we can... interacting with neurodevelopmental processes. Because our experiences in childhood and adolescence shape our mental health for life, it is crucial that these years unfold in nurturing environments, which promote mental health and prevent mental disorders. Three, mental health should be respected as a fundamental right by putting people living with mental health problems at the center of planning services and challenging stigma. Everyone is entitled to dignity, autonomy, care in the community, and freedom from discrimination. What are the Commission's recommendations? The Commission calls for increasing investment to realize these aspirations, improving services as part of universal health coverage, and recognizing that everyone, everywhere, is entitled to good mental health. These changes rely on a diverse range of groups from the mental health and development community to policy makers and civil society, coming together as a global partnership to improve mental health worldwide as part of the Sustainable Development Goals Movement. To learn more about the Commission's call to action, visit www.globalmentalhealthcommission.org. So just to say, this is not live. Uh, it will be live on Tuesday, and you will also see uh, what we're hoping to do is also to have um, some uh, a variety of other products, including a PowerPoint slideshow, uh, which uh, will – and this is something called a GIF. I don't know how many of you ever heard this word. I only heard it now. It's called a GIF. So, yeah? How many of you ever heard GIF? Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. You were in Sorry. Okay. <laughs> anyway, this is a GIF. Um, so um, – so as you can see, and there are many like these, so you know, health coverage is universal only when mental health is included. So the idea is to play on, uh, on established uh, you know, uh, words and, and metaphors and then to add a second piece of this. So that's it from us. Uh, we have about 10 minutes, I think, for questions. Uh, as I said, we, we're all sort of excited about next week and then uh, uh, the campaign will follow. I should just say the campaign is a very long, uh, it's planned over many months, if not more than a year. There are launches in, 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 uh, in Lagos, in uh, Lisbon, uh, in Seattle. Um, there, there's, a, you know, there's a whole agenda for engagement with uh, uh, translations, uh, etc., cetera, et cetera. So there's a huge community of people uh, who are working, uh, really taking this forward, and it's terrific to see how much of civil society is already engaged with this. Making life for the 28 authors is very easy. It's like, you know, we've written the piece and now other people are going to take it away and start doing what they want with it. And that's exactly the way that I, uh, that I think Shikhar and I particularly feel very pleased uh, to see happen. So over to any questions uh, or any, any, any clarification. Byron. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I didn't hear, I know that you had to edit this a lot, but I didn't hear you talking explicitly about the, about the benefits of treatment, about what we know at this point about the economic or the ability to work, et cetera. And I would just say, and also then about recovery-oriented care as a basic concept. And I would just say that when I talked to policymakers, one slide that said people went from being able to work 30 hours a week to 12 hours a week when they got to developed a mental health problem, and 
after treatment were able to work over 40 hours a week, but that single slide was more convincing to people than anything about the burden of disease, because they're actually interested in, in whether we actually have, I mean, whether what we, whether the investment actually produces benefits and at what kinds of levels. Is that documented pretty substantially in, in this report? Uh, yes, Myron. Very, uh, Myron. Very good point, and we do have uh, many sections on that, not only in the cost, but also on the return on investment, uh -huh. both in terms of the dollars, but also in terms of the lost health, which obviously is also quite important. This reminds me of uh, a recent lecture by Patricia, the ex-Minister of Health of Peru, uh, just yesterday or day before, who basically said, we have to change the whole conversation in the area of health, not only mental health from a spending ministry to a ministry that actually reaps the benefit of investment. And I think that equally applies to mental health. We have things there in the commission which uh, are, uh, are saying that message. And also we can develop some more dissemination products around that because the science is there. Yeah, we also have a, actually uh, what we haven't presented. You're right. There's a lot of stuff that is in the report which we have not presented. One of which is a fresh modeling of what would be the return on investment for a range of interventions for the prevention and treatment of depression at a population level. What is the investment, and what would you get back in terms of things like productivity and, and years of employment? So you're absolutely right, Byron. That is a very important message. And Dan Chisholm, who did some of the original work, is actually one of the commissioners. So yeah. he has made sure that uh, that uh, line is very clearly cut there. Please, right at the back. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for sharing all that you did today. Um, you talked a little bit about prevention. Uh, what do you, how do you think uh, would be the first step towards prevention um, in the field of mental health, and how could we reinforce it? So I'd say, I'd say the best buys right now is early child development by far and away. Uh, investing in the massive scaling up of what we know helps promote early brain development in the first. At the moment, it's 1,000 days, but it's, you know, I don't think that you, you, know, you stop at 1,000 days. That's a bit, little bit of a silo. Uh, but really across the early years of life, um, and as children grow into school age, uh, then also adding the school is another really important platform. Uh, for delivery. There's a lot of very exciting literature also coming out on school-based interventions, such as building skills for emotional regulation, changing school environments, for example, around policies on bullying. There's actually a lot out there. But, you know, much of it comes from other sectors. So, you know, for example, in this university, consider most of the work that I've just described doesn't come from the medical school necessarily, or even the public health school. It comes from the graduate school of education. Uh, so, you know, the, 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 the issue with mental health is quite unique in the sense that there are so many different disciplines that are interested in our well-being, and these disciplines have historically established their own particular silos of knowledge, their own journals, their own ways of thinking about the issue, their own audiences, and there has been actually very little real conversation between these silos. And so the idea of convergence is to get us to start thinking about how these different rich disciplinary traditions actually are speaking to one another in a way that is actually quite coherent. They're not, in fact, fragmented voices. They are speaking in a very, very coherent way. So that's what we're hoping for. Uh, you know, to the extent to which we can do that is, a, is another, another challenge. Yes, please. I would support uh, Byron's encouragement to make more of the economic return because there, there are several categories of argument one can make here. One is the humanistic values. It's better that people should live well than not well. The other is to uh, professional advice. But the third, and Heckman has been especially important in this in making the case for the economic return. But to pick up the question that was just made, Heckman's argument has to do with the timing of the intervention. As you're saying, uh, Vikram, in terms of the, the timing and the early interventions paying off, I wonder, particularly as you're meeting with all these ministers next week, is there a way to, to draw out that part of the argument more strongly? So it's a trick, because one has to make sure one doesn't ignore those who are already living with a mental health problem. And how do you, so to be able, that's why, I'm, again, you know, it's how we present the dimensional idea in a way that doesn't get a minister to say, okay, fine, we're going to put everything on, on the left-hand side of, of that dimension. Right. And I know for clinical, clinicians would be concerned about that. 
I, and that's why we've got the president of the World Psychiatric Association as a key member of the commission, because we absolutely don't want it to be an either or. We, we certainly don't want that to be the result of this conversation, and there is a risk that that happens. Equally, we don't want people to feel there's nothing we can do about prevention, because I think that is not the case. I think we do know a lot about prevention, uh, at least mechanistically we do, but we haven't really done much with that knowledge. And so it's nice about your argument about the balance across the spectrum of intervention. Yeah, well, that's also partly to try and show that depending on which discipline you are, we may be sitting somewhere on that spectrum. Yeah. But if we step a, a one step behind our discipline or above and look at the whole spectrum, we say, oh, we're connected to the others that's in this right. kind of continuum. Teresa and then Myron. Thank you both. This is amazing and such important work. I'm interested in your thoughts on quality and safety. And uh, one, what you think the big implementation science questions are going forward, and then with this move towards evolving uh, more task sharing, uh, what initiatives are required to think about supervision, the quality improvement and safety issues too as you move services into a range of providers? Let's take Myron's question as well, and then we can see how we are. Well, just uh, WHO through Shekhar is a champion MH gap, and it's been associated with low and middle income countries. And uh, there was a meeting where there was an opportunity to kind of reflect on trying to scale up MH gap. And one of, the, one of the takeaway messages from that for myself was that the more we talk about low and middle income countries and separate that from high income countries, the more we encourage not me, in other words. And I think the data you presented suggests that when we even talk about MH gap, we should talk about it as a universal uh, intervention, it has universal value, uh, not just in low and middle income countries, but in high-income countries, too. So I'm wondering if we should sort of abandon the distinction of uh, low and middle income countries. So I'll take Teresa's question. Yeah. So uh, in response to Teresa's question, which is really about quality of care, this is, of course, the next holy grail, you know, because we've now shown, to me, it is no longer an interesting question to ask, does star sharing work? It's no longer interesting. It's, uh, it's been done 60 or 70 times, you know, to ask that same, it may be, it may be interesting for specific kinds of issues. Um, so, for example, let's say developmental disorders. Yes, I don't think it's been done 50, 60 times. But if I to say mood, anxiety, trauma-related conditions, I think it's been done enough. The question now is how do we deliver these interventions in a way that can guarantee the sorts of quality that trials do? You know, because trials, of course, you know, we have an additional investment in ensuring quality, and that is not the case in the real world. Uh, so, yes, this is, a, this is not a, qu a question that has an answer yet, but we acknowledge that quality is the next uh, frontier, and this is where researchers need to start paying attention to. How can we sustain competency, get people up to competency? How can we sustain their quality after their competence? Uh, how can we ensure that they're safety so that individuals who are not benefiting in us and need to be referred to a more specialized provider, that that happens on, in a timely way? We don't have any of those systems. But that is the next agenda for implementation science. Uh, Myron, uh, one of the slides of Vikram actually showed the pyramid of services, the bottom being self-care and community care, that in between being primary care, and the top being uh, specialist care. The pyramid is equally important in all settings in all countries. And even in the high-income countries, the pyramid is usually lying upside down. There's not much self-care. There's not much primary care, whatever care is there, is specialist care. So I think, as you are very rightly saying, uh, some of the instruments that have been advanced by WHO, and the Commission does highlight them, are equally important for all countries. And a general doctor and a general nurse in a country like USA or Germany or UK should be much better aware and competent in identifying and treating most of the mental health problems, not all. So. And MHGAP is being uh, advanced as uh, a training for non-specialists, but not necessarily only in low and middle income countries. Thank you. Oh, sure. uh, this is a pretty specific question, but I wonder if you have any thoughts about the use of ketamine in treating severely depressed people in low resource countries. And I'm asking me because ketamine is readily available in low resource countries. It's fairly safe to give in low doses and it's not expensive. So it's a very new intervention, um, and I, we, we, we do give a nod to this new knowledge, but we don't recommend it because I think it's very early days. Uh, there's also issues around safety and how to be delivered. And who, so I think it, it's 
for those of us who are clinicians and work in the in the area of refractory mood disorders, etc., I think it's very exciting. But I don't know whether if we don't think it's actually ready for this kind of scaling up. There's so many other things that we know work, uh, but which are we're not even remotely delivering. So I think we really emphasize those interventions. Megan. You mentioned um, the doing innovation and research around the grand challenges model. Can you discuss clarify what exactly that model is and what aspects of it are, are, are most useful? Vikram and I both were uh, involved in 2011 in uh, in uh, doing the grand challenges, which was a consensus or other opinions of a very wide number of people to say which are the grand challenges in the global mental health area. And a paper was published in the in the Nature in 2011, which described six grand challenges out of 25, which were rated, and uh, some of them are essentially about the dis about the uh, dissemination and implementation science. So the Lancet Commission makes a recommendation. In fact, there is a table there which says under each of these, which are the questions which are top of the line for research and innovation. It, the Lancet Commission also emphasizes the need for innovation, uh, which are actually happening quite a bit in the low and middle income countries. Mm -hmm. And they have relevance even for high income countries. So it's not a one way uh, knowledge transfer, it's a much more a now a multilateral knowledge transfer. So that that's something which is emphasized quite a bit. But I'm happy to share with you the grand challenges uh, framework as well as the table which, uh, which is there. Okay, I think we've probably hit the, uh, Scott? Yeah. Yeah. This is wonderful. Uh, thank you both very much. Um, and, and good luck next week. I hope, hope we've prepped you for, 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 for next week. Uh, and, and we were all we just have to pray the UK government doesn't fall by that. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the worst thing of all after all this preparation because they're teaching at the moment. That's the only fear that I have. Yeah. <laughs> God, I could love to vote you next week.